My question is about something that you talk about in the paper less than you just talked about now, which is continuity in these topics and the way we, we look at them. And I guess, so my question is, is, is it important that that exists? Uh, I think you sort of predict that it does, that the kinds of topics and conversations and methods of construction we have now have a founding era pedigree. Uh, but what if, what if we discover that that's not so, or that there's you know, more or less distance between the ways they thought about precedent and the ways we do now, or the ways we talk about the, is that a, is that a problem for us? Is that a problem for them? Is that a problem for originalism? Um, so I want to push back on this running out metaphor, which seems unhelpful. Uh, and it seems to me that the thing that runs out isn't the original meaning, but our knowledge of, or sufficient knowledge of original meaning. So this whole distinction uh, and this, this I think, is, is, is very much in the spirit of, 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 of John's remarks. It's ontological epistemic. So you've got the original meaning, and it's, it's, it, that's the Constitution. So if that runs out, the Constitution just isn't there. But the thing that runs out is, is, is our knowledge of it. So you, but you have two things that, that are going on. One is uh, 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 what kind of errors are, are, are more important. Another is who has information. So you've got a burden of persuasion and kind of a level of clarity. How much clarity do you need? That's you know, familiar stuff. But then you've got, separate from that, burdens of production. So saying, hey, government, if you want to take away somebody's liberty, you've got to like, explain yourself. They, you know, challenger of, of a constitutional thing still has, has the burden of, uh, of, of persuasion, but the government has the burden of, uh, burden of production. What's the real, how do you decide what kind of uh, 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 burden of, of production and burden of persuasion you should have? Well, it's the relationship of epistemology and, and ontology. The kind of thing it is tells you how, the, what methods you use to, to, to find it. Yeah, so I'm, I'm also interested in, <clears throat> in the question that, that Will asked. Um, before I get into that, I should say I, I really very much enjoyed the paper. It's, it's, very rich. There's a lot of questions that one could ask about it. Um, and I guess uh, one of the things Jack says in the paper, he talks a little bit about you know, what the topics or the, you know, the uh, interpretive rules were at the time of the, at the framing versus later on. And he says they're kind of latter day descendants of them. And sort of, and I guess I want to throw out a possible hypothesis here about. Um, the, the relationship there and, and, and how, and, and two ways of viewing some of these um, topics or interpretive rules. So, so if you look at some that, that Jack talks about from the, the bank bill, you know, so there's the tax and structure and purpose and consequences, and we can go on actually talk about social contract theory and natural law. So one way of viewing those things is actually to view them in a very originalist oriented way. You know, you look to structure because there, there's, you know, the, you, you look at the tax and see it establishes a structure and we know something about what, why people would have wanted that structure. And then you, 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 so you use structure as a way of figuring out what the likely original meaning was given that there's an ambiguity. And you could do that for purpose. You can even do it for consequences because um, if, if it's not controversial consequences, if, if there was some, uh, 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 you know, largely consensus ideas, one would want to follow that. Um, even social contract theory, well, this is what everyone believes in our world. They, they wouldn't have, have, have been violating that natural law. Um, they had a certain understanding of natural law. Um, now, so that, that, that might be one way of thinking about these things, sort of very originalist oriented, all the, the rules fit into original. Then there's another way maybe it's a 20th century way that starts to talk about structure as divorced from those things. Well, there's a structure in the Constitution established in the New Deal or whenever it was, and, um, and we've got natural law type arguments. You know, sure, the framers didn't believe in that stuff, but who cares? And so, so imagine we have these two different ways of thinking about the, the, the topics. So, the first one, the first thing to point out is that one could be very much congenial to originalism and the other one would not. They would look very similar. They would look like latter day descendants. But um, possibly they would be corruptions <laughs> of, of those and, and, and sort of um, 
So anyway, that's, that's a hypothesis of what might have happened with respect to our interpretive practices over time and why it might look like there's a greater similarity between what's going on than actually is. So, uh, uh, let me first uh, uh, talk about Chris's point and then I want to talk about both your related questions. So Chris, basically I think we can cash out what we're worried about in terms of epistemology versus ontology. And in epistemology, so you know I also reject this runs out metaphor in the paper. So you could cash out the question in terms of Chris's project by saying, we lack knowledge about how, about how to apply the being, the sense, in this new changed context. We need help. The help we need are a series of burdens of proof, burdens of production, right? A set of, of rules of thumb that we might use to basically help us do this work. That would be what topics are in your model. In your account of how to think about the Constitution, the topics will play this role. But notice that that's because constitutional theories adopt topics for their purposes. That is, you'll come up with a set of topics which will help you do your work. And those topics will, be, will we hope, appeal to other, to other folks. They'll say, oh, I see what you're getting at. I understand why you're making these kinds of claims. I understand what you think is relevant. And that's how persuasion will proceed under the ground rules that you're setting. Yeah. I am delighted that the two of the first three questions are your questions, because this paper is in conversation both with uh, Mike and John's uh, original methods of ritualism and also with Steve and Will's uh, law of interpretation. And, the, uh, and let me restate what the problem both of them are worried about is. Uh, suppose we have a series of methods or, or topics or ways of construing texts or working with texts to solve, analyze problems and solve them and persuade other people about them that exist more or less contemporaneously with the founding. Time moves on. Other people come up with different problem solving devices. Uh, the state of human knowledge increases. So for example, we, you know, there's political science is founded as a discipline. And political science has enormous amount of work done for thinking about incentive structures. And if you organize things one way, these are the incentives. And if you organize them another way, these are the incentives. And uh, uh, public choice theory is developed trying to explain how democracies work and so forth, right? The question is, should those new problem-solving devices be seen as legitimate problem-solving methods in the present? Even if these problem-solving devices were not available to the founding generation? There's another way of seeing this, the question. And it's a question that goes to the question of legitimacy. That is to say, what forms of problem solving will we regard as being legitimate, even if their origin isn't at the founding? Right? Well, one possible way of doing it is by making a distinction between that which is a, a pure continuation of the, t of the methods at the founding and those which are mere corruptions. Right? But their solution is different. Their solution is to ask, at a certain point in time, right, are there a set of legitimate ways for including new problem solving techniques into the, the corpus of what we argue about, how we argue? And as long as these were added in an appropriate way, it doesn't matter whether or not they were present at the founding. Now, I would argue, just to use the most powerful example of this is positive political theory or public choice theory. Public choice theory, we can find things in Hume, we can find things in the founding that sound like public choice theory, but they're not public choice theory because they don't have all the bells and whistles, they don't have all the assumptions. Is it okay though when we talk about federalism or when we talk about separation of powers or when we talk about democratic representation to make, to make arguments from public choice theory? I say yes. I say it's perfectly appropriate. It's perfectly appropriate because this is an appropriate and legitimate way to add new problem solving techniques to a constitutional system. But this is a assertion, not a proof. And so there's a lot more work to do to sort of answer this question. It seems obvious to me that this is an appropriate thing to do. It's not inappropriate. If someone said, I'm sorry, you can't make that argument, the founders wouldn't have recognized it as an argument, this seems obtuse to me. It just seems like, what? 
right? But then cashing out why that's so, in fact, is the conversation that the three of, uh, three of our groups would all have to have. John, if you, uh, anytime you have anything to add, just uh, feel free to do so. Um, OK, our next uh, group of three is John McHale, Eric Siegel, and Steve Smith. Jack, thank you for this paper. I thought it was extremely interesting and, and helpful. I wanted to ask you a question about your basic conceptual framework that goes back to something you say at the very start of the paper, which is that really the most important question in originalism, as you understand it, is not original intention versus original meaning versus original understanding, but how thick or thin one's theory of original meaning is. And the question is, uh, I, maybe a somewhat technical question, but you know, so there's a simple way to think about the landscape here. We've got interpretation on the one hand and then construction on the other. Interpretation, as Larry Solomon, as I think you have characterized it, is not just purely semantics in the linguist sense, but also semantics plus pragmatics. And you refer to that, you say, you know, it's, it's, it's the original semantic meaning plus any technical terms and any inferences from background context necessary to understand the text, okay? So you're not so thin as to say original meaning is just the linguist semantics. It's more than that. And then we've got construction. My concern is that as you flesh out construction very persuasively to my mind, the topics, it seems to me, are as likely going to come into the pragmatic phase of understanding original meaning. Because topics are considerations. They bring in to play uh, all kinds of things that you lay out here, natural law, text, structure, purpose. And if that's the case, I'm going to start to lose the handle on how this is all supposed to run. I understand what narrow semantics in the linguist sense might mean. And in a couple places, you seem to gesture to that when you talk about bare logical consistency with the text. Uh, that, that would be the Gricean, to go to Stanley's paper, you know, side of the entailment implicature distinction. That, that, that could be what uh, thin semantics is. But if you are going to hang on and Larry is going to hang on to the idea that pragmatics is part of original meaning and have this very rich theory of construction, I'm, I'm going to ask, wouldn't pragmatics itself start to look like... Um, construction, to really do the pragmatic part of the project, you're going to have to bring in assumptions and arguments from this whole set of topics. And then I, I think construction is going to swallow up uh, interpretation, and it's going to be construction all the way down, except for the very narrow, thin uh, notion of semantics that one might hang on to. So I I'm, I'm guess I'm wondering, in light of that, where you would, you know, come down, or do you see a real problem there? I see a real problem there, and I think that's where the argument's going to have to go, and I want to see what you think about that. I love the paper, Jack. I, 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 I love all of your work with one exception, <laughs> and that is the selling of the work, the advertising of the work. So you say you became an originalist in 2006 and 2007. I wish we had more time to talk about that moment or moments in time. Um, but in this paper, you have a paragraph where you basically say you were a legal realist. You adopted realist critique. I think uh, his, his a paragraph, there's, a, there's a sentence in the paper where Jack says, nothing in here should be seen as inconsistent with my adoption of, or belief in realism. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he said. So, and, and I think a lot of your early work is amazing in that regard. Um, so you're a legal realist who clearly thinks far removed post-ratification historical evidence is very important. It's not just ratification era evidence to you. Your view of history is more like Barry Friedman's sedimentary type idea. I agree with that. Um, and then I can go on with 10 other things that suggest, um, when Ed Meese said we want originalist judges, we knew what that meant. But when Leo is saying it, you're not getting a nomination. <laughs> there's, there's zero, there, no, there's zero chance even though you're an originalist and they're looking for originalist judges, that you would get a nomination in this administration. All of which leads me to my... That too, that too. <laughs> but you would, even if, but, it, but even if you were 40, you wouldn't get it. Um, so... Well, I wasn't an originalist when I was 40. So, okay, fair enough. <laughs> my question is, um, it feels like you're trying to have your cake and eat it too. And if one can be an originalist and a legal realist at the same time, I think one better have a very strong view of deference. Otherwise, 
it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, my question is kind of along the lines, I think, of John, John Harrison's comment. Uh, you say you kind of started in this project, this paper, um, in response to uh, Mike Rappaport and, and others to whom I question whether if uh, <coughs> originalist claims to have a theory and that leaves a whole lot to construction and only gets you know a little out of interpretation, is that isn't that a problem? It, it seems to me it wouldn't be a problem in the sense that we'd have any reason to doubt the sincerity of the person you know the person's claim to be an originalist, but uh, the it would be disappointing because it would seem like originalism isn't giving us what we might have wanted out of originalism. Now, different people might want different things out of originalism. Some people would put it in terms of constraint uh, on judges and so forth. Uh, I would probably put it in terms of self-governance and trying to have a way in which the people can deliberate and then they can make a decision with some confidence as to what the decision will do, you know, that it will do the things they want it to do and won't be used to do a lot of things that they didn't want it to do and, you know, and would be very upset if they anticipated doing that. And if a theory leaves, let's say, 50% or 90% to construction, you might think that's not giving us, you know, those kinds of things. So, so you're trying to, well, solve would probably be too strong, but, you know, say something that would be helpful uh, with respect to that problem. And um, John's comment, I think, suggests that there'd be the worry that you haven't really helped with it. You know, if anything, you've kind of aggravated it because the topics are so numerous and be, can be used in so many different ways that they're not going to give us those things if the constraint or decision, you know, if that's what we wanted. Um, I think reading the paper that I, I sort of thought that your response to that really was more not in all the stuff about topics, as in when you talked about attitude and a sense of faithfulness, say, sure, there are lots of topics and you could do lots of things with them, but you need to do it in a way that's faithful, you know, have an attitude of faithfulness to the Constitution. That won't maybe give determinacy, but it will you know, help with this. And that part of the paper I found to be you know, eloquent and kind of inspiring almost, a worry that it might be inspiring in an idolatrous kind of sense, but, but I think you really made it quite clear there that you're saying, there, you don't mean fidelity to you know, the Constitution of 1787 exactly, you mean fidelity to the constitutional project, you know, to the ongoing we the people and so forth. So, so if that's what you mean, I wonder whether you have just sort of aggravated again the, the concern that you started off trying to address. Or another way of putting it, I, I thought with you, uh, is that and I have no doubt that ever since you, you know, adopted originalism as your position, people have been questioning you about this sort of thing. But if it's living originalism, let's say with someone else it would be, isn't construction doing 90% of the work and originalism is only doing, uh, interpretation is only doing 10? With you, it would be, isn't the living part 90 or 95% of your position and the originalism, you know, in any normal interest is, is about 5% of it? Uh, uh, would that be a fair, fair characterization? If so, is it true that you haven't really done much for the, for the problem you set out to address? Uh, these three questions are related, so let me see if I can put them together. And take. So remember, realism is a descriptive account of processes of change. So one could be a realist in terms of explaining what has happened and why it has happened, and be an originalist from the standpoint of one's normative theory of interpretation. To give you an example, Robert Bork was a legal realist in exactly the same sense. That is, he came out of... The, the, the intellectual culture of the Yale Law School, which is an intellectual culture of legal realism, and his view about American uh, constitutional history was realist to the core, uh, and he, he was an originalist at the same time. So there's nothing inconsistent with these two uh, positions, because one is a claim about understanding how the machine actually works in practice, and the other is a claim about what, e what individuals should do within the system, what their interpretive attitude should be within the system. Which brings me to your next point. Remember that the, an important distinction between the new originalism and older forms of originalism is that new originalism does not see constraint as the central goal of interpretive theory. Um, Randy might put it a little differently, but I'll say that fidelity is the central goal of the new originalism. That's what we're aiming at. 
And so that's, and you've latched on correctly, I think, to the, the uh, part two of the, of the paper, which is the discussion of constitutional fidelity. And you rightly see that as important, and it's rightly placed at the beginning, because of course if you don't have fidelity, if you don't have the attitude of attempting to make the constitutional project work over time, returning to the, the Constitution, not to the project, the project is what you're in, you return to the Constitution, you redeem the Constitution and not the project then in fact all the work you do with the topics is for naught, right? Because it's, you know, it's just a whirlwind of nonsense. Um, so it, it can't be, right, that a new originalist theory of construction can do without a theory of fidelity. And that's the project. I think in fact it's responsive to that problem when posed. I will also agree with you that if the problem that originalism is trying to solve is the problem of constraint, then the new originalism will not solve that problem because the new originalism is not designed to solve that problem. Now, put Randy to one side because Randy has a different theory of legitimacy than I do. Another way of understanding the new originalism and its differences from older forms of originalism is whether it has a single account of legitimacy or a dual account of legitimacy. This is very important. And Randy's theory of legitimacy is different. It's complicated and tied to a conception about natural rights. So mine is a little different than Randy's. And in fact, uh, Elon Worman's book is really good on this. He actually takes the three of us, Randy, me, and who's the third person he uses? Do you remember? Anyway, he used another version. I forget who the avatar of the third version of originalism is, but this is in a different account. And in each case, he shows how legitimacy is cashed out differently. They're all originalists. They all claim fidelity, original meaning, but the background theory of legitimacy is different for each of them. And so part of what you're pointing to is, and part of the discomfort you have with my living originalism, is not my claim to be originalist, but your discomfort with my background theory of legitimacy, which I'll say a few words about. The background theory of legitimacy is dualist rather than monist. The claim is that there are two sources of legitimacy of a, of a constitutional republic like ours over an extended period of time. One is the legitimacy that comes from the act of making law and sticking to the law that was made. That is, the law made remains in force until such time as it's changed. That's a source of legitimacy. It's both an act of democratic popular sovereignty and a rule of law obligation, right? That's one form of legitimacy. The second form of legitimacy is the ability of people in the present to accept the Constitution as their Constitution, as something that belongs to them and can be understood as the work of their own hands, which involves uh, a, 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 an identification between themselves and the people who came before them and an identification with people who come after them. This form of, of legitimacy is based on a different conception of what makes a constitutional system legitimate. And my claim is that a, a form of originalism that is based only on the first will fail at the project of legitimacy because it will be seen by parts of the population as increasingly alien and not the work of their hands and not something that they can accept as their own. And therefore, there must be a way to incorporate the forms of understanding of successive generations into the constitutional project, and that's what will give it the legitimacy that's necessary. You saw a version of this problem in the discussion of Christina's paper. One way of cashing out the project that Christina is working on is that she's noticing the legitimacy gap that's produced for people of color and for women. If you adopt too monistic an account of the theory of legitimacy that will undergird originalism. I claim, although I can't prove it here, that this dualist account of legitimacy is better suited for making originalism make sense to women and to people of color than the monistic account. But that's another conversation we could have. But it's precisely my adoption of a dualist theory of legitimacy which I think gives you pause. Okay, what was the last? The last point is John's, and John's point is a deep point. And rather than try to completely solve it, let me just say the direction in which I would go. I am delighted to hear that Mike Rappaport and I now agree that in the project of interpretation narrowly conceived, that is, interpretation proper, discovering original meaning, it would be appropriate 
and not inappropriate to use familiar topics of text, intention, structure, even natural law. That is to say that it's an okay thing to do in the project of interpretation, the discovery, ascertainment of original meaning. That suggests that the topics are available for that part of the work of the new originalism, and therefore for that part of his project, which is the ascertainment of original meaning. The topics are also useful for the part of the project of in interpretation we call construction. But the goals of interpretation, that is ascertainment of original meaning, and the goals of construction are different. <laughs> the ascertainment of original meaning is to determine that which is fixed, that which cannot be varied, that which cannot be changed without Article V amendment. And the topics are useful for discovering that aspect. Think about the dualist theory of legitimacy now, right? It's the part which was put in place and cannot be changed without amendment, which is the law and stays the law until it's been appropriately changed. The work of construction is a different work, and it's tied to the second account of legitimacy, right? The account of legitimacy which allows us to see the Constitution as the work of our own hands, as our Constitution, as something that we understand ourselves as being a part of. That purpose, that task, is a different task, and it will use history in a different way. In that task, for example, we might say, to take a point that's related to Mike uh, McConnell's work, in the 39th, 40th, and 41st Congress, I agree with these guys, and I disagree with those guys, even though they were all participants in the creation of Reconstruction. These guys were right. Not because they were in the majority necessarily, but because they understood what the Constitution means. And in construction, I pick winners and losers. Not in the sense of majorities. I pick who I think got it right and who didn't get it right. That's the work of construction. It's a rethinking of what history means to us today and honoring certain features of the past as what we regard to be truthful to the constitutional project. And in that sense, the topics will be useful too, but they'll be useful in a different way. While well, we use history in the act of interpretation narrowly construed is one way of using the topics. How we use history in the act of construction, which is the creation of a constitution that we can regard as our own, is a different way. OK, um, so I'm not entirely sure on our next group of three. It depends on whether Kurt Lash was raising his hand or scratching his nose. Uh, uh, OK, so, so now I've got our group. Uh, Horatio Spector, uh, Kurt Lash, and Don Drips. One, one of them is, is that it opens up a bridge between American constitutional scholarship and continental legal philosophy. In the part of the world from which I come, people like uh, Perelman and Fiebeck are very influential. Yeah. And there is a whole industry of uh, topical inquiry, and uh, the th it's called the theory of legal argumentation. There are many, many, many professors of legal philosophy who pursue this kind of inquiry. Now, they oppose the, the other school, the school of the antique logics, uh, and they have a, a kind of intellectual fight that have been last, lasting for 30 or 40 years now. So my question will focus on that kind of problem or, 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 or tension. I mean, people in the antique logics challenge uh, uh, the theories so is, of... Is Alexi in that school, the school that you're seeing as Yes, opposed? actually it started with uh, Aulis Ardio, Alexander Pechenik, yeah. Robert Alexi, they were all influenced by Aristotle, and, sure. and also by <coughs> Stephen Tulmin, who right. by the way was sure. an American philosopher, so he, he was an important figure too. Now, I, I think that it's, I mean, it's very difficult to, to try to uh, track all the nuances and subtleties, but I think the main, the main point of the difference or opposition is as follows. Logicians always say that the connection between considerations and the topics and the conclusion is not a logical inferential uh, reasoning inference. So there is no logical validity. And obviously, uh, when we have a reasoning that starts with a premise and uh, reaches a conclusion, and the reasoning is not a valid one, unless we include among the premises one of those interpretive or topical rules. Right. Now the question is that once we do that, the problem is how to justify that new, that further premise that we add to a set of premises. And then the problem of uh, justification remains because as a matter of fact, topical inquiry can be seen as just a, a descriptive enterprise, try to understand the method of persuasion in a given intellectual community. But interpretation is more a normative thing. So 
uh, the normative or justificatory problem still remains. Uh, and originalism could offer one solution to that problem if, for instance, you claim that uh, the constitutional framers somehow intended the constitution to be uh, reasoned about through the topics that were uh, prevailing in their days or some other theory. But the question I, I, I ask you is exactly that. I mean, uh, you obviously see the topical theory as a kind of implicit justificatory theory. So what's your justification for that? I mean, maybe it's in the paper, but it was not clear to me. And actually, this is not a problem I have with your paper, but I, I was trained in the other school, in the logical school, so yes, I never was totally convinced by you know, the, the, the claims of uh, the theories of argumentation. Uh, okay, wonderful paper, uh, Jack. For years, all of us know this, right? Uh, for years, the conversations at lunchtime have been, what do we do about Jack? Um, <laughs> because your, your theories are outstanding, your argumentation is, is elegant. Um, we can argue about your analysis of history, you and Randy, you know, will argue about commerce or something like that, but your, your, your project is much bigger than that. And, but we just can't trust you, um, <laughs> because it's not clear that you're, you're trying to go to the same place that we're trying to go to, okay? And so we can't trust you. That, of course, this is, is exactly <laughs> right. 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 That is exactly the problem that we face. We make arguments. We construct theories of originalism that we think are logical and compelling, but we just aren't trusted because people don't trust where we're going. Right. So. I think as we encounter Jack's work, we need to bear that in mind. Um, the arguments he's making are compelling, and he's creating a theory that is reaching across communities, and we simply have to take, we have to take him seriously. And, and what he brings to the table, I mean, I'm, I'm going to disagree with you. Um, what he brings to us in his arguments about the attitude of good faith, I think are astonishingly compelling and inspiring. And I know it works off of work that you've, you've done before and arguments you've made about this civic, uh, our law, you know, our approach before. But I think this is a beautiful account of what our project is. And it's an account that is cross-community. It should be an account that, um, that should be attractive to both originalists and non-originalists. And it presents an opportunity for these communities to gather together in a common, in a common project. So I thought that was wonderful. I thought that was absolutely wonderful. Um, you then address, you're, you're addressing the problem of, of pluralism and uh, the, the challenge that plur, uh, pluralism brings to originalism and, and what your account does is you, you push that problem into the construction zone. Um, so that leaves originalism um, um, as its own standard of constitutional interpretation. Whatever problems we have with this pluralist account, um, it, can, it can be a conversation that goes on without necessarily undermining originalism. Um, that's, so he's created a space, right? It's a theory here that creates space for both originalism and the accounts, the accounts of, of pluralism. I think that is, again, very important to us because that creates an opportunity, once again, for originalists to engage in cross-community conversation. We can talk about the problems of pluralism without, without being smacked with, um, uh, with, this necessarily undermines originalism. No, it doesn't. We can address pluralism without it necessarily undermining originalism. That's incredibly important um, uh, to our project. Um, but the, the question that I, that I have for Jack, though, is that even if that helps us preserve originalism while ad addressing pluralism, um, I'm still wondering if at the end of the day there's going to be an impasse between communities, OK? Um, because our account of construction is going to require a theory. We're going to need some type of normative theory to figure out how to approach uh, the construction zone. And you have a dual theory, right? Um, but we don't, OK? And, and, or at least, at least we're wondering. We're wondering whether or not we should have a, a dual theory. Because as I read your paper, I wondered whether or not, at the end of the day, the normative theory of originalist in the construction zone is going to be necessarily exclusionary. That the ethos of originalism is a, is a jealous ethos, right? <laughs> 
and that whatever account of the rules of construction that are going to apply in that zone are going to necessarily exclude, and I haven't, I haven't thought deeply about this, but I think they're going to necessarily exclude forms of argumentation that you would insist are commonplaces uh, within, our, uh, within our, our common discourse as it's developed, but that originalism cannot make room for if it's still going to be committed um, to this normative project of, of that original meaning. So I, that's my question to you is unless we adopt your dualist theory, um, legitimacy. Uh, leg uh, legitimacy, there's going to remain this impasse and our communities are going are to remain ships passing in the night. Done. So uh, this picks up a bit on Rossio's question. So the topics are, are extensive, but they're interesting in part because of what they leave out and exclude, right? And so, so what happens when there's an unconstitutional basis of possible decision that enters the rhetoric by enthymine, the unstated premise of the sort that, that Horacio is talking about. And I can tell you that it's not permissible to say in, in any court, well, you know, judge, about African-American criminality, or on the other side, you know, judge, about how police officers lie all the time. Right? And those premises can't be articulated, but they have a very powerful explanatory, at least a plausibly explanatory power on doctrine about warrantless and, and, and warranted searches, respectively. So the question then is, I take it the attitude of fidelity excludes overtly, consciously deploying states' rights as a code word for racism. Um, I might be wrong about that. Maybe, maybe it doesn't. But, 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 but then what's gained by, by submerging it psychologically where these same considerations become uh, the grounds of decision that aren't even open to the, to the clash of argument. And the last takeaway from that is, is that if the attitude of fidelity excludes that sort of inclusion of unspeakable premises by, uh, by judges, what about lawyers? Can I play to those unstated, unspeakable prejudices and still be engaged in the project? So, topics are the forms of public rhetoric. So topics are public rhetoric. So if you make an argument from states' rights, you can make an argument from states' rights regardless of whether or not your motivations are racist or not, right? I just want to you to understand the position where we're starting from that we agree. That is, an inappropriate topic of reference would be, Your Honor, you should rule for me because my son is very good friends with your son. That is not a valid form of public justification in the American system, although I can imagine cultures in which it would be an appropriate form. Here's another example of something that's ruled out as, an, as a topic. Uh, Your Honor, the reason why my client should win is that um, my client's last name, uh, if you sum the numbers in the letters, uh, are 556. That is the same number of letters uh, when you sum the term due process of law. And so we can see that my client's side is on the, uh, the path of due process of law. This is a permissible form of argument in Talmudic studies. It is not a permissible textual argument in the American system. So these are public forms of justificatory rhetoric, is what the topics are. You're interested in a different problem, and it's a deep problem. I was talking to Randy about it last night. This was the whole point of the Rochefoucauld uh, aphorism that the hypocrisy is the complement that, that vice pays to virtue. Lawyers are paid to argue things they don't believe, right? Lawyers are, are paid to adopt positions that they do not think all things considered are the best positions. But they nevertheless argue in front of judges, and then judges have to decide cases. Is the system of constitutional legitimacy undermined by the possibility that within the system of argument, there are people who don't have an attitude of fidelity? They go through the motions of making public justifications, but underneath, they lack the attitude of fidelity, which makes the system work over time. So the Rochefoucauld, uh, uh, you know, aphorism is designed to suggest why it might be possible for forcing, by forcing people to talk in terms of public regarding justifications, that in fact we can keep a system going over time, even if people have all sorts of reasons to defect and to secretly in their hearts have bad purposes and non-faithful purposes. It's not a complete explanation because of course, if in fact it turns out that enough people in the system just are not interested in enforcing the Constitution, but doing something else entirely, then there's no guarantee that the system won't drift away from constitutional fidelity. This is a point originalists emphasize over and over again. I just simply want to say that even if you're not an originalist, you could still see why that's an important value to try to preserve. The second point I wanted to make is related to, to Kurt. 
you guys see me in originalist conferences, so you ask certain questions of me. You don't see me so often in non-originalist conferences, <laughs> in which I get a completely different form of distrust <laughs> directed at me. Right? I remember a wonderful conversation I had with a, with a scholar, it was like the 2012 or something, and she, she came to me and says, why are you doing this originalist stuff? Why are you saying this? Why are you saying that? I says, because I believe the following, and then I gave, I talked about rule of law, popular sovereignty, the fixation of, of law at a time, and it has to be the same until it's changed, authorized. I said that to her, and she said, oh my God, you really are an originalist. And then, of course, comes the hermeneutics of suspicion that follows from it. So there is a sense, just to take Kurt's point, that I am engaged in a kind of missionary work. I'm willing to take upon myself this, all these religious metaphors. I really do think that there is a common conversation that needs to be preserved in a time of extreme political polarization and mutual distrust. Um, and I, I, don't I don't believe necessarily that my project is the project that will bridge all the chasms. My project would be one of several projects that people might engage in in this particular time, but I do what I can under the circumstances in which it's possible to do it. And I hope you'll understand me in that light as opposed to some other light. What was the second thing you wanted to say? Is excluded? Oh, is originally necessarily excluded? Well, I don't think that describes Randy's work or Steve Sachs' work or Will Bode's work at this point. That is, I don't read their theories as necessarily having that consequence. You could ask them that. If enough people, if enough people it's not true of, then I don't think it's a problem for originalism. It might be a problem for some originalisms, but not for others. I am so glad you mentioned the civil law tradition. So Vivek, as you know, gets into big trouble because he introduces the topical system in a civil law jurisdiction, Germany. And the civil law tradition, as you well know, is a tradition that prides itself on trying to talk about premises and deductions from premises and logical consequences of premises. And it follows the particular version of Aristotle, which is about a traditional classical logic. It has never struck me, rather it, it has always struck me that you can cash out the whole topical theory in terms, of disguise, uh, in terms of enthymemes and hidden uh, premises and, and syllogism, if you wanted to. But it strikes me as completely uninteresting. That is, you're fighting over something that isn't that important. If Vivek had written his book, Topics and Law, uh, in a, a common law jurisdiction, I think everyone would have shrugged and said, so what else is new? Because you know Levy's book, Introduction to Legal Reasoning, you know that one thing that Levy says is the common law method is always affirming the consequent. The common law method is always committing the logical fallacy of affirming the consequent, and basically in reasoning by abduction and reasoning from previous examples as a way of thinking about a problem and then coming up with a slightly different way of characterizing the problem, and thus reasoning from that in the future, and so on, so on, so on. So the common law tradition has never been so uh, scrupulous as uh, in terms of art, cashing everything out in terms of, of syllogisms. And so in some sense, that's why Alexei and uh, Pesenik and all these other people just you know, people in, in common law tradition read them and they go, okay, and what is this supposed to do for me? So it's ironic then that Vivek does his work in a place where he's least likely to be uh, useful and he doesn't do his work in a place where he might be most useful. They are very popular now in constitutional theory. Oh, they are? They've, become, they've made a comeback? Very popular. Uh, Actually, that's a standard method in constitutional law education. Well, this must be the end of constitutionalism in the civil law tradition. It's very popular now. Oh, my goodness. Well, I'm, uh, I'm afraid we are at our time limit. So with apologies to the many people on the queue that we didn't get to, uh, Jack will have to preach the word to you in private. There you go. <laughs>